Well, hello and welcome back to Lunge and Learn. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Brie Castellini, Seed and Sparks Film Community Manager. And before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that the land that we are all on is occupied territory. Please check the YouTube live comments feed or the video description for a First Nations COVID relief fund to help uh, support those who are struggling during this now eight month pandemic. And also an amazing app we will add into the comment section which will tell you exactly whose land you're currently watching from. So I implore you to check both of those things out. And if you are here and are somehow not familiar with Seed and Spark, the company that we're all here on behalf of today, we are a platform built to support creators by providing tools for wherever you are in your creator journey, from crowdfunding education to creative distribution approaches. And of course, we couldn't start without shouting out our wonderful partners at KitSplit, who partnered with us to bring this event to you today. They make renting gear more democratic, more convenient, and more accessible to all. And they'd also love to give everybody here today a 10% discount on film equipment rental with the code SEED and SPARK 2020, all caps. So definitely get on that. We will put the uh, the the actual just copy and pasteable discount code in the comment section below, as well as in the video description. And you can find uh, more of their wares at kitsplit.com. That's kitsplit.com. So uh, that's enough of just me. Let's bring on our wonderful women in cinematography panelists so that we can kick off today's event. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. And I hope you enjoy this discussion as much as I'm looking forward to it. All right, hello, hello. We got a packed panel today. Uh, one of us is on set even. Uh, so let's let's kick things off by introduction. So if you could all introduce yourselves, what your uh, current occupation is and uh, anything else that you want us to know about you to kick off the conversation. Christine, let's start with you. Hi everyone, I'm Christine. Um, and I just wanna say, first of all, like thank you for having me. And I'm like so excited to be here and like with all these other awesome women, I was checking out their stuff and I was like just in awe. Um, so thank you. But uh, I am, so a little bit about me. I, I went to film school in Boston University and I graduated in 2015 and uh, moved to LA. And then uh, from there I kind of I jumped in as a camera PA on a at a marketing agency slash like studio, um, and they I really like learned from them and kind of built up from there. Um, and then about like a year and a half of doing that and working with like different clients and stuff like that, um, I ended up getting laid off, which at the time was like a terrible thing to happen, but was actually like a blessing in disguise because then it really pushed me to go into freelance. And um, it really pushed me to go into camera department. So now I've got like five-ish years of camera experience. I've worked every job in the camera department um, on like various types of projects. Uh, but the kind of work that I really wanna do and like I'm focused on is just a lot of nonfiction storytelling about like Filipino Americans and immigration. And uh, that's, really my, that's really my passion because I'm Filipino American and that's something that it's a, I think it's a culture that should be shared and should be represented. And I really feel like I need to be a part of that. Awesome. All right, let's 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 head on over to our next person, which is Shadai. Shadai, can you introduce yourself? What are you working on and uh, what's your background? Yes, hi, my name is Shadai India. Um, I am based in LA currently, but originally from Palm Springs, which is super random, but <laughs> I decided to uh, pursue filmmaking Kind of just inspired like myself at a young age by just like creating documentaries like with my friends kind of messing around uh palm springs but then i randomly decided to go to film school and pursue this career and my family was like what does that even mean but i kind of still stuck with it um but ever since i moved to la i've been uh freelancing primarily in like the commercial space but um on the side i shoot a lot of more passion projects centered around black identity and black experiences i have more so of a passion towards telling those stories specifically. Um, and then on the side, I have a, a production company called The Red Futon where uh, we freelance kind of, one, bringing up uh, mentees in the camera and g and &E department, but also producing content for other film uh, clients of color and filmmakers of color. And then I'm also a part of Made in Her Image, which is a really uh, dope platform that is dedicated to educating young girls into camera as well. That's awesome. Thanks so much for, for introducing yourself. Next up is Sylvia. Sylvia, tell us about yourself. Hi, how are you guys? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you might want to speak up a little bit, though. Okay. 
Hi, um, so my name is Sylvia. I'm originally from Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, I, I, came, I came into film more so, um, cameras were always around my house. My dad was always interested in videography and just, you know, having memories and having home video cameras. And I was always, my older brother and I were always interested in taking in the, out of his cabinet and making stop motion videos or anything of the like. I'd also like to get my friends together like in junior high and make silly little videos. From there, it went into like skate videos with friends. And even though I couldn't keep up with them, I could keep up with the camera. So that was really cool. Um, but I never really thought that for someone like me that came, I, I crossed the border when I was a year and a half with my dad. And uh, I was undocumented for the first 17 and a half or three quarters of my life. So going right up until 18, I, I really didn't have a plan until the future because I didn't know what direction I was going to go in, or if I'd even have uh, documentation to be able to do anything here. So it's it's really like a muddy area where you know it took a long time to go from that point to like six years later returning to school and then realizing like oh wow I can really pursue this and this could be for me. Um, UCLA and AFI were both my dream schools, and I was fortunate to attend them. Um, I was able to attend UCLA as an undergrad. And through UCLA, I had a really great opportunity at the end of my senior year to cam out for Francis Ford Coppola on a experimental shoot that was happening at UCLA. It was incredible. And it was with all the DPs in my department. Um, and not just my department, because there was three women. That was it. <laughs> but um, the graduate program had some really, really incredible cinematographers. And um, I was able to work hands-on with them and led by Francis Ford Coppola and... Um, it was, it was incredible. So that really pushed me to pursue this and make me realize like, okay, like I love this. I love what I'm doing. I know I can see a career out of it. Um, another very, very pivotal moment that happened for me at UCLA in particular was uh, working on what was Women of Light. It's now um, Lady Camera Guy. And that's a film that's going to be coming out in Camera Image. I was fortunate to, um, to know Julia Swain right at the right time and we became great friends and she's uh, an incredible cinematographer who I, very, I really admire and um, she she brought me on the team it was first you know on camera department g and &E. ultimately I ended up at um, camera operating for our cinematographer for that shoot uh, Teodora Totoya um, and that was an incredible experience because we got to interview almost every single woman that is a part of the ASC and I was able to sit there one on one and ask them the questions about like career insecurities. How did you do this, especially in your time when there wasn't as much support as there is now? And that really made me see like this is a perfect moment for me to really push for this. That's amazing. And uh, finally, Kaylee, can you introduce yourself? Who are you? What have you worked on? Uh, what's a little bit about your background? Hi. Yes, I'm Kaylee Brown, and I am actually based in. Salt Lake City, Utah. So I've been doing cinematography for about seven years. And honestly, I've always been, I have just always really been into documenting. I always, from a young age, I've been taking pictures. I'm like any time I was with friends, family, anything, I was basically like the unofficial like photographer for that. And photography eventually like grew into videography for me. So I really started out in videography and I'm actually a self-taught cinematographer, so um, I have the unique perspective of not going to film school, but I um, have loved it, and I've I've learned um, just by being on set and by videos and just different things that are out there, and I it's been really cool and really fun. Um, so most recently, I was part of the production company Apple Juice Productions where we made content that um, was for women and by women. So our sets had um, 50 to 100 percent of women on our crews. Um, and we um, made sure to like try to include as many people of color as we could and just like making good experiences for women. So that's something that I'm really passionate about is telling um, women's stories and just making sure that their voices get to be our voices get to be heard and in addition my mom is from Guatemala and so I'm very passionate about um, the Latinx community and making more opportunities for um, female filmmakers there so 
That's me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for all of that. So the, the first question I want to kind of ask you guys is what was the first film project you worked on and what was your role and what was the most recent film project you worked on and what was your role? Uh, so let's go in the same order, Christine. Um, so the first one, I'm trying to think. <laughs> and it can be student it film, too. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, like, I mean, I was doing stuff in high school, just, like, making small things with friends. And, I mean, my first, like, legit film, I would say, would be was from uh, from film school, um, doing, like, our Prod 1 class, just, like, learning. And, you know, it's just basic stuff, but it's, it's so helpful. And, like, just being what was able your to official play role around with the on camera. that first project, um, do you remember? You're everything. like you are like pretty much a one band one man band kind sure. of deal in prod one. Um, so you do like directing, you do the cinematography, which is like what I wanted to do anyways. But I I realized that I was not as great when I was talking to um, actors and stuff. So I was realized that uh, the camera was really for me. Cool. Um, and most recent. Most recent, I was operating on a Disney Plus show called uh, Dog Impossible season two. <laughs> um, it's coming out sometime next year, I think. Um, but yeah, that was like interesting, especially in COVID, like a completely yeah, and we'll, different- Yeah, we will get to that. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say what I was gonna say for that. Perfect. And you were just in the in the camera department, uh, camera operator, you said? Yeah. Great. Shot it. What about you? First and last. Oh, the first question kind of threw me off for a second, but <laughs> I feel like uh, my very first film, uh, like Kaylee said, I was self-taught um, initially as well. And I would just kind of make films with my family members just because we would uh, we would have a lot. My family is very communal, so we would have a lot of like big family vacations. And so uh, one time I kind of made this really artsy, abstract um, short film about a game of pool, but I like kind of elevated it by like, implementing black and white and also Ooh, uh very moody like my family members which <laughs> getting them they don't know anything about film or even just like how cameras work and so like that was interesting for me but i was like kind of directing dp that you could probably find it on youtube somewhere it's kind of cringy don't like look for it, but it <laughs> it's actually not on youtube it's nowhere don't worry it's about nowhere. it <laughs> and what about your most recent project um i just shot something this weekend actually uh it's a uh, I've been doing a lot of commercial work lately and I've been wanting to like do something more so for myself. And so uh, these wonderful women reached out to me on Instagram um, and she wanted to kind of uh, create an abstract kind of hybrid documentary uh, short film about her personal experiences going growing up as like black and queer in America basically. And so it was like three short stories that she told uh, relaxed at a couch, very intimate. And then we kind of, uh, brought to life some other like surreal vignettes from her life so that should be coming out soon hopefully and you were um, the dp on that project yes i was the dp on very very cool uh <laughs> sylvia what about you um like i said I, i'd always do little videos stop motion or just videos with my friends uh, or skate videos when i was younger but i would say the first film that i created that was it was a story it was when i knew how to actually control light and exposure and whatnot um, it would be at, in my undergrad at UCLA, um, all of the undergrads have to start on 16 millimeter film. And yeah, we actually study the camera for two weeks, just reading before we actually get to touch one, um, because we have to be certain that we know how to handle it. Um, but the very first one was, uh, it was black and white, 16 millimeter film. And, um, I was a director DP. I had a team, I think total of five. And I was warned over and over. Sorry, those are, it's right outside my house. <laughs> no worries. We, I live in the very same area, it. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the film was basically a recollection of a memory that I had when I was growing up with my dad and my two brothers, which was um, my, my brothers and I loved to play with my dad in different ways up until when we were like older. Um, he would come home some days and just either wrestle with us or hit us with a bunch of pillows and we'd have huge pillow fights. Um, there was one particular day where we decided to um, set everything up to the, to the, to a, like the Conan theme song. Uh, do you remember Conan? Oh my God, I'm aging myself. <laughs> but uh, it was the Conan theme song and all of, all of us ended up popping up when my dad came out 
and attacking him with pillows. And that was one of my fondest memories as a child. And I wanted to recreate something like that and honor that memory of my family. And I felt that black and white was perfect for that. And I had a family, uh, a family um, that I put together of actors. I was really, really warned for your first movie, do not do film. For your first movie, do not bring kids. For your first movie, do not do stunts. And what did I do? All three. Of but course. it came out great and it was fun. <laughs> and what about your most recent project? My most recent projects today, um, I'm on set and uh, we're going to be shooting a music video for an artist. Um, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting challenge and I know we're going to get more into it uh, in regards to how we're shooting during the pandemic. Yes, but uh, in regards to this one, I'm sorry? I said yes, definitely. I, I was saying yes, we will definitely get back to that topic. What role yeah. do you, are you officially the DP on this project? I'm the cinematographer, yeah. Awesome. And uh, the great thing about that is uh, we had extensive talks about how we're going to film uh, um, romantic interaction with no touch. And we can chat a little bit later about how we figured that out. Well, very cool. I'm excited to hear about it. And Kaylee, uh, first film project, most recent project. Um, so first film project, like everyone else, is kind of hard to pinpoint, I feel like. But... I actually also made lots of like films growing up with my family. Um, I have a lot of cousins and a big extended family that we're all pretty close with. Yeah, I see each other nodding your heads. So. What about like your I official first um, project, the first time and, you were like, I'm making a um, film, it's gonna go somewhere. I I guess the like the really first like official like film set project was on um, the web series, The Kate Moreland Chronicles. Um, we, it's, it was like a vlog style web series and um, really fun, but a lot, a lot of work. We kind of shot it over a whole summer. So it was fun. I've learned, I feel like I've learned a lot since then. And you and, were credited as cinematographer on that project, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my most recent project, I actually um, recently went, well, right before COVID, went to the Philippines to shoot some events um, and commercial stuff. I was working for a corporate company a little while and we got to go there and do that. So that was really fun. And um, yeah, it was cool. And what was your credit? Cause I know you worked for that, that corporation for a while. Yeah, so what is your I credit on this one? Uh, cinematographer is like right. cinematographer for that, yeah. And editing as well. I think you, you said yeah. that you've done. Cool. Yes, I do. I do both. I like to edit and film. So uh, let's let's go big picture again, uh, since all of you have obviously had a lot of time in this industry. Uh, what do you think is a misconception that people have about cinematography, either the work that goes into it or like what cinematography even covers? Do, do you have like a common misconception that comes to mind? Anyone can take this one first. I'm going to open it up now. I can talk about that real quick. Sylvia, give uh, us a misconception. <laughs> I think I think one of the big biggest things is, um, and I think it's for me at least, it was fundamental for me understanding how do how do I manage myself as a business. That was the most um, I, I did not have the clarity that I have on it now. When I was thinking about going to, to school, when I was thinking about shooting, when I was thinking about getting into film, I had a different cons um, like idea of it. Um, especially if you're coming from a world of like nine to five and W2s, it's very, very different for you to then transition. Mm -hmm. And especially if you have an entire, which I was fortunate, I, I don't have a family that like adheres to nine to five, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. They're, they're actually very supportive of whatever, wherever path I go in. But um, initially to, I think if you don't have a background, for example, um, in, I don't want to say hustling. <laughs> Freelancing. But I mean, you know, freelancing and in um, uh, coming up with your own, creating your own momentum. I think that is fundamentally what um, what I had to realize. Like, how do I how, how do I hone this in? How do I make this work for me? And how do I create a schedule that I'm happy with and then I'm not stressed out because freelancing sounds terrifying. So for the most part, people think, oh, it's fun and this and that. Yeah, it is, and there are some ex super exciting parts. But at the same time, deep down, to make it sustainable, I have to be thinking long term. You know, I want to know even if I'm freelance, I would need to know what I'm doing two weeks out because otherwise I I, I, I just need that for myself. And mm -hmm. for me to be able to be creative in this moment, I need to know what's happening at least two weeks out. So I think at, does that kind of cover that? Yeah, that's <laughs> great. A, a misconception that you had yourself is a, is a great example of that. Anyone else? I see uh, Shadi and Christine. Oh, Christine has unmuted herself. Christine, what do you got for us? 
Um, well, I think one thing that I, and I totally agree with Sylvia, because that's something that like, you know, like I said, I got laid off and I was going from a salary to like not knowing what I, what I was going to do in like two days. So I think definitely feeling that and also feeling like the pressure of, you know, in LA, especially there's a lot of people buying really fancy cameras and all this gear that they think that they need. And it's really, the, it's not about that. It's not about the gear. It's about your eye and it's about what, what can you do with what you have? And like, don't, I know some people like, and I'm not trying to be like, <laughs> don't buy any no gear. No shade, like, I'm, but. I'm, I'm totally guilty of that uh, myself, but like, it's not something that you need. Like there are movies like Tangerine where it's, everything is shot on an iPhone. Like you have what you need in your pocket and in your head. Like, I think that's, that was the biggest thing for me um, coming up to realizing like, you can rent anything that you need or find it from a friend or whatever you, you need to do. You don't necessarily need to buy it. And that also goes that when I figured that out, it made my checkbook look so much better. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Kaylee or Shade? Oh, Kaylee, go. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with that. A lot of it, a lot of people think it's all about the camera and what that has to do with it. When really, like, there's so many moving parts to cinematography that people don't realize that it's not just like, and this is something that I've definitely learned over the years too, that it's not just setting up a camera and leaving it. There can, there's a lot of motion. It's working with the director. A ton of cinematography is like actually way more about lighting than it is about the camera, even like you just, and if you have good lighting, you honestly can use anything to film it. But if you don't have like those necessary skills to do cinematography, like you can't, a good camera isn't going to help you. It's any better than like an iPhone will and stuff. And, and that's been fun to learn. Um, I mean, I've been getting into more of mobile filmmaking just for fun um, and shooting with my iPhone and getting a uh, moment has a lot of like cool phone lenses and stuff. And they um, have made it really like um, they've given out good opportunities to people to be able to do things with mobile filmmaking. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's, it's all about your eye and it's, it's very visual and it's, yeah, it's just a lot about what you're seeing and not just the camera. So it's about the craft, not the kit. Shade, what about you? Any misconceptions either from yourself or people around you that have about cinematography? Um, I think uh, more so in terms of like relation to crew, like people act like it's so hard to find like women <laughs> crew in camera and g &E specifically. And I feel like even this space alone, but like more and more every day, I'm finding more and more people. And it kind of makes it hard for me to kind of wrap my head around like why producers and directors struggle so hard finding us. And so I think uh, that's like been on my mind lately and how it's more a matter of like producers and directors like going out of their way to do the work to find us. Cause it's like, we're all on social media, sharing our work, sharing our friends work, creating communities like amongst each other. And it's a matter of like people just putting in the effort to find 100%. us. 100%. Actually that leads me to my next question. So Shada, if you want to answer this first, how are you guys finding work uh, both pre COVID obviously and post, is it mostly personal referrals? Is it you working your way up? Like friends recommending how, how does work come to you slash how do you get to work? Um, I think it's a mixture of everything at once. I feel like there's a lot of politics of being a cinematographer. It's about how you kind of share your work online, but also uh, put in the effort in real life too. So it has been a mixture of recommendations and then also just like outreach on social media and then a mixture of my agent as well. And so it's just doing different routes to like kind of find. <laughs> find. Oh, you, you have an agent. Can you really quickly speak to that? Like when, how, how long have you had an agent uh, and how did you connect with them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, social media actually, uh, I just got signed uh, three months ago-ish. Um, so I'm fairly new into the agency scene. I'm learning a lot as I'm going, but i um, definitely very thankful to be, I'm with uh, Gersh. Cool, and you just, they, somebody put out like an open call on social media, you reached out yourself, like cold outreach? Uh, no, she act, my rep is Patty. Uh, she reached out to me personally. She kind of found me through like recommendation, but also uh, through social media as well. Very cool. Uh, anyone else have uh, advice on how you were getting jobs, how you have been getting jobs, how it's how most jobs get given out in this weird little community of filmmakers specifically? 
Um, I honestly find that I work with a lot of friends um, and that's like just making, networking to me is really just meeting people that you like, people that you want to hang out with outside of set. And um, a lot of that just like, I didn't go out seeking this, but a lot of um, women brought me up. A lot of like ACs brought me up from a camera PA to like a second AC and just keep moving me up. And I think like specifically women, like women in this industry are mostly supportive of each other and want to help each other come up because I can, all of my jobs, I can probably trace like the flow of recommendations um, down to like three, three uh, close friends of mine. So I think, I think being aware of like everybody around you and like who, it's not about who's gonna get you the next job, but it's like who you like to work with. Um, and I, I really appreciate all of all of that. And I'm like super grateful for, for those girls because I could have been like, I haven't had to get a day job or anything like that um, since I've started freelancing, so. That's great to hear. And the three friends that you mentioned, uh, are those film school friends, people that you met working on sets? Um, one of them is a film school friend. And then two of them were just people I met on set or like through mutual friends. Yeah, so. very cool. Uh, Sylvia or Kaylee, how are you finding work? How has work found you pre and during pandemic times? Um, I, I, I can chat about that. There was, um, I think it's been the same pre and after, and it's been also um, the friends that you make. It's It's been, you know, kind of insular as far as that. Um, and also what I've noticed is uh, when I've worked with, people who have, you know, who are maybe in sound or acting or other departments like a couple years ago who are now starting to get into producing and they remember me from set and how we worked. And I think, I think that's been very helpful. I've been very surprised that there was an actress that I worked with that actually got me one of my biggest jobs during the pandemic, which was a short that hit really close to home for me. And she remembered me. She remembered the way that, um, uh, just the behavior on set and how we, we really, really just connected. And, you know, almost a year later, she calls me up and tells me, I'm now producing this and I'd like to bring you on as a cinematographer. So I think that's been really great um, from job to job. Um, but people I remember, have, people have long memories. They, they your your behavior yeah. matters. Yeah, your behavior matters. And what's funny, it's not even so much of like what you teach, how great your cinematography is, or one thing that I keep in mind so much is that people will remember how you make them feel. And if you're the DP on set that wants to hoard your knowledge and just demand what you want because these people are getting paid and they're, you know, and you're their boss, then people are going to remember how you made them feel. Um, Absolutely. I love that. Kaylee, what about you? Yeah, I think it's all about, I mean, a lot about it is, kind of who you know, not necessarily like knowing people at the top, but just kind of speaking to what everyone has said that you do, you do make friends with who you work with if, if you work well together. And, you know, you, op you can often find people who like, yeah, you'll find sound people or genie people who you like to work with and who like to work with you. And so they'll bring you on or they'll recommend you because often people are always asking about someone else. And so, I think that's usually how it happens. I've also had a few people who have worked on some of the sets that I filmed and they've <laughs> they've known, like they've made it a point of making sure that they hire um, female cinematographers. So I have had people reach out to me for that or reach out to find others. Um, so that is also nice, like making it known like that you are there to like help women or just because then they know like, okay, like I, I I don't know. I think it inspires other people to want to be able to make a good environment on their sets and it helps them 
do that as well. So. Totally. Yeah. I think a thing that has come out of a lot of these lunch and learn sessions, not just for obviously crew work, but for anyone, I think there's this misconception that networking is meant to be, you meet an executive at a bar and somehow that's how you get to pitch your next great show or whatever. But the most valuable networking happens laterally, happens with people at your level because you never know who's going to make it big first. And if you make a good impression, they remember how you, how they made you feel the, how, how you made them feel like Sylvia says, people remember that and whoever gets popular first will bring everyone else up, especially if you built a strong community, especially if you branded yourself as someone who has this mission with their work, like so many of you have mentioned. So like, yes, absolutely. No matter who you are in the chat right now, um, and we will get to your questions. Actually, I'm going to have a couple of them right now. But yeah, everyone in the chat, no matter where you work in the film world, relationships are everything and it doesn't have to be who can hire you it could just be who can recommend you so keep that in mind um so yeah with that i wanted to actually get to some questions because we've had a handful of really great questions coming in already uh so the first question even though we we clarified that gear is absolutely not everything uh this commenter asked do you guys own any cameras or do you gals of course own any cameras and what do you own so do you have gear that despite being able to rent everything you do actually personally own can you tell us what's in your kit? Anyone can start. Okay, <laughs> I can, I'll go first. Cause <laughs> um, well, I just, I don't own a ton. I just own like a black magic pocket and um, just a couple of like the Canon lenses. And like for what I do, that's all you really need. Honestly, lighting is, is a lot of, <laughs> um, a lot of what, what you make of it. And um I see the comment about I keep being asked what gear I have and it it affects if I get a job or not. And I feel I feel that on a level of like there have been times when I've straight up lied. I was like, yeah, I have that and I'll just rent it from whatever. And like mm -hmm. sometimes that's part of the hustle, like depending on what the job is, of course. But um, I think that's something that you keep in mind. Um, and I don't think like eventually you will find someone who is is excited about your gear and also is willing to help like, oh, well, if you don't have that, maybe we can bring this in from somewhere else or whatever. Um, so it's it's all about just keep keep at it and keep developing your eye and showing people what you got really. And no, you can rent it. Have a good relationship with the rental house yeah. so that you have, yeah. you own this here. Oh yeah. It just yeah. means you can grab it first. And I, and I have friends who I like, I hook up all the time and I like give them stuff and we kind of have a similar relationship where it's like, if, especially if it's something that you're shooting, like, yeah, of course they're going to all help you out because they all want you to do well. Absolutely. No one's rooting for your failure here. Anyone else want to share their, their gear? What cameras do you ladies own if you own one? I don't own anything. <laughs> wow. I, I don't own, well, okay. Um, I've shot for Aperture and, um, sh and they're, they're wonderful. And, uh, they've been so gracious in, um, sending me lights. And so I have a little package of lights that I have from them. Um, other than that, I, I don't own anything. I, um, the, at the time when I was leaving school, it was a time where it was very much up and down. I, I had the more seasoned DPs, the grads telling me like, oh no, if you're like that good, you won't ever need to own because people are going to want you and then it's just gear. Any place has it. But then it was also that point where gear is becoming so inexpensive that everyone's starting to own and producers now expect it. So I was really in a place where I was just like, okay, am I going to have to buy something? And um, I had this in my head that, oh, if you buy it, if you're not that great. And you're, you know, I had that in my head from, right. again, again, a different, a different time when things were very expensive. Sure. And I started to realize, you know what, you need to have something that you can grab and run and go with. And that I shouldn't have had that in my head ever, personally. That's also, a, I believe, a kind of a mentality of um, probably like, six, seven years ago when, you know, you don't have a Komodo coming out for $5,000 or a Black Magic coming out for what, two twenty five hundred. Um, so I, I think it's always nice to have something. Fortunately, I do have access through the production companies that um, I've shot for and they're gracious enough to lend, lend this out to me and lend me their insurance. Um, otherwise, if I didn't have those connections already built, I would definitely think about buying something small at least. Cool. Great advice. Shade or Kaylee, what's your, what's your gear? Um, 
Yeah, I think I think renting's where it's at. I um I do want to get a black magic pocket, um, like Christine mentioned, but um <laughs> but I just I've rented for most of the shoots I've done and it works well. I think that also like definitely solves the problem of yeah, like if you're getting asked what gear you have, like, all right, well what gear do you want? Let's rent it and then I'll work off of that. But I I do think that yeah, it matters a little more about like you than the gear and so hopefully the place would mean that but I think would uh hopefully the place would want that as well but you know it's it all just kind of depends and so I for like run and go stuff like I said I I mean I basically use my phone just like if I want to go film like something small like on my own um but I I really enjoy renting I also think it's it's fun because you can try the new things that come out regularly and you're not like stuck with one camera or then you have to like sell it or anything. So there's different, there's definitely like benefits to owning and renting, but I think cool. it works either way. Shall I? Yes. Uh, I, yeah, this was something I was struggling with for a, a good portion of my life. Cause like, like in film school, everyone is like reaching towards having that Alexa package or that red package. And also it was like, it kind of promoted like that film bro culture because it was like when I was just starting to freelance, like obviously people are going to hire the like white man with his red camera that can just hop on and work for a low rate. Whereas like for me, I was negotiating getting even a budget for rentals or like um, add ons to my own personal package. But when I first started freelancing, I literally was shooting on like a Sony a6300 and I was shooting like music videos. I was doing a lot of videography. I was doing a lot of BTS kind of moments and like building that kind of portfolio helps me kind of eventually invest in like an Ursa package, which comes in handy for me personally. Um, when I am kind of having more of those like run and go projects where someone's like, can you shoot tomorrow X, Y, Z. And so it is helpful for me to have all my gear in one place without having to coordinate uh, with different vendors and friends and hookups. But it also is an art form in itself to like be able to finesse where you can, like everyone was saying, like making sure you know like what your friend has and also being able to say like, hey, I can support you this way if you need it for a for a certain project or something like that. And oftentimes um, that still happens. Like even my short that I shot this weekend, um, we had a low budget, we, we couldn't go through the rental house, but um, because I was able to like reach out to my community and say like, oh, I have this, can I uh, rent your package for X, Y, Z? I can lend you this for another future project that you have X, Y, Z kind of helps build like community, but also making sure that it's more accessible for you to be shooting your passion projects and things that you actually really care about. Absolutely. Chaotic with gear and stuff like that. Yeah, the barter system is strong in the film community, so definitely rely on it. Also, <laughs> not for nothing, but our partner for this event, KitSplit, is trying to make rentals a lot more accessible. Some of the rentals are actually offered by fellow filmmakers. So reminder that you can get 10% off uh, a rental through KitSplit with Seed and Spark 2020 as the code. So uh, good opportunity for a plug there. So let's move on to the next question. The next question uh, might be a, just a quickie, uh, any recommendations you might have, but this person uh, went to film school, but focused more on acting and directing than for cinematography. So is there uh, a place that you would recommend to go to learn some of the, the principles or any advice you'd have to self-teach yourself cinematography? Oh, I'll just hop in here. Um, Hell yeah, do it. Actually, uh, the nonprofit that I work with, uh, we provide like, sometimes it's like free, some opportunities are free and some are like on a sliding scale basis. But uh, I personally teach cinematography, um, if you guys are interested in taking some classes by me, but um, there's also a mixture of different um, screenwriting workshops and also directing workshops that we offer uh, more for like younger up and coming filmmakers, but also uh, I've had like folks who are like 40 plus in my classes as well. And like, it's just like a really dope learning environment. So that's a good platform. And then also um, if you guys are familiar with Sporas, it's this new uh, kind of collective dedicated to like bringing together by POC uh, cinematographers and folks in camera and GE. Um, but it's really, uh, it's really fun to be a part of this community specifically because they're always posting like free resources. Like every single day I'm like scrolling through the chat, you see like people are dropping like PDFs that are helpful for like um, gear breakdowns or people are doing like Zoom chats with like lens tests and lens manufacturers and stuff like that. So uh, definitely reaching out to like online platforms that are providing these resources. Seed and Spark has organized a bunch of really dope stuff. 
Um, but a lot of, especially during COVID, like a lot of um, organizations are organizing free resources right now. So it's just a matter of asking around and doing some of the work. Absolutely. Uh, I'd also just like to plug Rocket Jump Film School. They haven't made a new video in a long time, but uh, they have a lot of really great sort of like 101s for sort of the technical aspects. So for lighting, for framing, for shot listing and um, storyboarding, things like that. So if you're just looking for a YouTube resource to kind of check in with on a lunch break or something, that's one that I would recommend. Um, I wanted to chime in about that uh, as far as like where to get more so sources and education and whatnot. Um, if you're trying to switch gears. Um, I I didn't, uh, if I finished the first year, and so technically I'm an AFI alumni, but I dropped out. Um, and I knew within the first semester being there that I was gonna drop out, even though it was my dream school. Um, so what I ended up doing, the, th the thing is, you know, I paid for the entire year, so I saved the full year. But the thing that I ended up doing for the second year is, um, Mind you, I had the most incredible anxiety dropping out because of the name and the prestige and whatnot that comes with it. And I had wanted this for so long. And I, the very first job I had where I was still an undocumented immigrant and um, my boss's son attended AFI and my boss was a multimillionaire. And the, when I thought about AFI, I was like, ha, no, like don't even think about it. So to come to the decision to leave was super, super, super emotionally difficult for me. Um, but it was the right choice for me. And what I ended up doing is creating um, goals for myself for the next year. If I'm not gonna be in school, and if I felt that I wasn't getting the education that I wanted out of this school, where can I go and get it? And I scoured the internet. I scoured the internet for panels. I scoured the internet for film events, for Q and A's, for chats like this. I filled up my calendar because I said, okay, I can sustain myself pretty okay for a year while I figure this out and while I build my momentum to now work full time. And since I wasn't planning on just dropping out and not having a thesis and not going to festivals, not doing any of this, how do I build my world around me that almost feels like that, but I get what I want out of it and I create my schedule. If I was not an undocumented immigrant who came from, uh, I, I'm from, um, a city. I grew up in Whittier in Southeast LA and I really did look for friends in film and there just wasn't much connection. So had I not had that background, um, I don't think I ever would have gone to school. If I had access in another way um, or if it was this time to be honest and so much is online, I don't think I ever would have gone to film school. For myself, it was necessary and I'm very grateful that I did do it. It gave me incredible opportunities. but. Now that I saw that the last year that I was supposed to be at AFI, I constructed my own education. If you walk into RED, they'll give you tutorials on how to use your cameras. If you want to get to ARI, if you're not there, but you want to go online, you can find that online. And uh, you can find lens tests, you can find filter tests, you can find really in-depth stuff. There's also, um, I've, never, I've never signed up for it, but I have a few friends who have done GCI, I believe it's called. I cannot recommend it myself. All I know is that I have friends who have done it. Um, I think it's called Global Cinematography Institute or something like that. But it's a like a couple of thousand bucks for a course, but it's better than like a full couple years education, you know, um, worth. And yeah, just scour the internet and make yourself a schedule of like this month I want to learn this, this month I want to learn this. Um, I think that was the most helpful for me in my last year at AFI. I also, uh, or last year. Um, I also made sure that I had projects that I wanted to book that would be, they would basically be what I would have been doing if I was there, like my thesis. I did a different film outside of it. So yeah. Totally. Yeah. Google it and practice. I think those are the, the two big takeaways. Uh, so really quick, we've got another question. Um, how do you find you're able to hold slash prove your rank ability confidence on a set and in a networking sense as a woman cinematographer, especially amongst a sphere of mostly male counterparts? I really want to answer that, but I just talked a lot. So <laughs> yeah, let's, 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 I, I saw Someone both uh, both Christine and Shade kind of like lean forward to unmute. So uh, Christine, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. So let's go you and then Shade. Okay. Um, 
it's definitely one of those things where it's like, I don't know if you guys have seen Knock Down the House featuring AOC, but there's a scene where she's like, I need to take up space. I need to take up space. And that's like kind of what it is. You know, you just have to like, I, I have a lot of doubts in my own head, but I do not let them out. <laughs> you, you, everybody does like, that's just natural. Um, but really just keeping your head down and working as like working and having a great attitude is that's going to show up so much more than like anybody realizing, you know, that, Oh, that she's, she's a girl, she's different. But like, just showing that you are here and you're serious and you're professional and you're here to work. Um, that's really what gets me going because it is tough. A lot of the times I walk on and I'm the only one and you know, they're all like growing out about whatever. And <laughs> you kind of feel like this pressure to all of a sudden be someone you're not, but that's not what you should do. You should be proud of who you are and just walk in and say, Hey, I'm, female AC operator, DP, whatever, and I'm here to work. And I can show you that I'm just as good, if not better than anyone else you know. Amazing. Shade? Uh, yeah, literally what she just said, like all you can really do is do the work. It's kind of like, it's daunting to just like get caught up in your head and like doubt yourself and like like psych yourself out like inherently we're all going to be anxious the night before set but it's a matter of really putting in the work and making sure that you at least feel really good about your pre-production materials making sure that you're communicating with your department heads and making sure that they have a clear plan of like what's going to be happening and that your lighting overheads are up front and you're communicating with the production to like make sure that everything is transparent so that when you show up on set you know I did everything that I could do anything else that happens that um <laughs> is derogatory against women is like out of my control because I know that I know what I'm doing and I know that um I have a clear plan for how today is going to run. But other than that, inherently, there's just always going to be doubts. You have to kind of just accept it and have a weird kind of battle with failure and insecurities and self-doubt and imposter syndrome. But um, just making sure that you care about what you're doing at the end of the day. Totally. And Kaylee, I know you have a lot of, you have like agency yeah. corporate work. Do you have uh, any experiences that you want to share advice from that perspective of, of kind of being on a team? Uh, I know mostly with male colleagues. Yeah, um, I think just really be confident in your work. Like you're you were hired for a job for a reason. And remember that like you don't you didn't just like come on there and everyone's like, what are you doing here? Like you're there because someone brought you on and your work is good and you're you're doing a great job. Um, I mean, I I have worked with a lot of male coworkers and um, different crew members and a, a lot of the times they're pretty respectful and uh, sometimes it really just like is in your head not that I'm saying like that um it's not real at all but um like don't don't let your doubts get a hold of you like keep them in your head and just like do do your job because you're going to do great you're going to do fine and I think that's the thing to remember and you can't control what other people are going to say but you can show them that you can do a great job like no, that's not going to change so I think that's Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Sylvia, I knew you wanted to ask a question, but I can't believe how much time we've already passed. And I really want to get to a couple of others. So let's talk about COVID shooting. Um, just a show of hands, who's worked in camera department since COVID hit? I know some of you have already mentioned. So Kaylee, Kaylee kind of has. Yeah, I know. Okay, so uh, let's just go around the ring. What has that been like? Like, how how substantially have things changed? Is there anything that you had to learn anew to shoot in these uh, experiences? Like, what what has it been like? Tell us the tales from the front lines. Sylvia, how about we start with you? And then we'll go to Christine, because both of you are, I think, literally on set right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I... I know we're moving on to this question. Can I just make one comment to the Please. original question? Sure. How do you find you're able to hold and prove your rank ability confidence as a woman cinema cinematographer? Uh, I think the, the perspective on this is what we have to change. Because the question is, how do I, how do I prove myself? You got the job, you're hired, you're already proven. So I'm not on set trying to prove that I'm working. I'm focused on delivering a great like tone and story that the director is wanting. I'm not focused on whether or not I need to prove myself to a gaffer or a key grip or anybody else there. If I'm the DP, I'm, I got hired for a reason. 
So I think the perspective of that has to change. You don't have to hustle for whether or not you're worth being there. You're already worth being there. And no matter, and by the way, people who actually think that, you know, that, that personify this confidence and whatnot, most of the time they don't know what they're doing. And you'll find out the further you get in, the higher you go, that a lot of people don't know what they're doing. So you don't have to hustle for that. Anyway, that's all for that. Yep, as, far I as, that. Shooting, I, as far as COVID shooting, I think it's a least interesting uh, question. So I want to leave it to someone else. That's, that's awesome. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I, answer, I should say, least interesting answer. Got it. So Christine, what's your, what's your COVID work life been like? Oh man. Um, so just, I'll be quick, but like the operating in general, wearing a mask is, and it's, it's in LA, it's been hot and a lot of things have been, have to be outdoors. So it's just, it's, it's tough. It's tough in that sense. I had to like relearn how to breath control basically. Um, but I mean, you know, it's what we got to do to keep everybody safe and to keep, keep this industry going while this is all happening. So, have you felt safe on set? Like, do you feel good yeah. about? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel safe. Um, and I just, you know, we get tested so often and everyone's wearing masks. Everyone gets it. Like no one can hug me. So <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> is that a feature not, or a bug? <laughs> I'm not really a hugger anyway. So. <laughs> uh, Shadi, what about you? What's your COVID shooting experience been like? Any advice, any big takeaways that you weren't expecting? Um, yeah, uh, I think the first, so like the first shoot I did back from COVID was weird. Like it was so unsafe. There were no protocols. Like, I don't even know why I did it. <laughs> I feel like I was kind of stressed about money at the time, um, but it really scarred me and helped me learn like what to ask for. And obviously like the larger productions are better and people know like what they're doing now and safety feels good and people are getting tested. but. Um, I think that's something to really be transparent about uh, before taking on a job now, because it is your life is at risk and some things aren't worth risking your life if people aren't getting tested or if there isn't someone at least like advocating for your safety on set. And so that's what I've just been asking before taking on any jobs. Like, how are you um, implementing COVID safety before I sign on to this project? Because uh, at the end of the day, we should have our livelihood and feel safe with um, when we're creating what's on that list for you? Like, have you turned down jobs because their answer has been unsatisfactory? Yeah, like if people aren't getting tested or at least like trying to advocate <laughs> for getting tested, um, if uh, there aren't like supplied masks and hand sanitizer and uh, if food isn't like organized correct, just a lot of like the nitty gritty small things, just making sure that uh, your production's looking out for you because when you get COVID, they ain't gonna look out for you if it's not transparent in the beginning. So um, I think just making sure that's communicated. Totally. Any other thoughts on COVID shooting advice to give out to cinematographers looking for work right now and what they should be thinking about as they go out there? Sylvia or Kaylee? It's fine if not, we can we can move on to some other questions. Cool, let's move on. Uh, so Maria asks, is there a benefit in narrowing the departments you advertise yourself in? So like what your cinematography brand is, i.e. focusing on seeking only cinematographer gigs or only AC gigs? I wanna talk less, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you you can talk as much as you want. I just, you know, there's so I, many brilliant women here. I wanna make sure I everyone's think, got a chance. So Sylvia, please take it away. Sure. I think it's going to also kind of dip into a question that's on the chat that's discussing if any of us want to move into directing and whatnot. So I think I can answer both of them at the same time. Um, I do think that there's a benefit with that because the more jobs that you're on where you're you're crewing with um, and a producer see you as an AC or as a gaffer in lighting department, the longer it's going to take for them to not see you out of that. I think that there's still some producers that knew me in undergrad who will still um, – call me for certain jobs. And so, you know, it takes a while for them to realize like, okay, they're doing something else and they're actually more skilled in this department than, you know, what I initially knew them in. Um, so it takes some time. So I think the longer that you're in there and the more you advertise yourself in that, that the more those jobs will keep coming to you. Um, so what, I mean, I, I will crew for my friends any day. I, I love being on set with my friends. I will crew for them any day, but, but, every, but the, the, the distinction is clear that I'm there because I love what I'm doing and I'm going to help them. It's not necessarily because this is a path that I want to go down. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of clear as regards to that. And if you're able to have these conversations with people around you and just let them know where you're headed towards, um, that's more likely as well. Like people would say like, Oh, Hey, I remember you said that you're really interested in this. I have this happening. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and they'll start offering you, you those type of jobs. Now in regards to what, um, there was a question in the chat regarding if any of us are interested in moving into like directing VP. Um, did you, do you want me to answer that later? Um, no, if you if, if if it transitions naturally, I just think yeah, it's, I, I, I think love so. that your advice boiled down to like dress for the job you want, and so in this case, it's like brand yeah. for the job you want. That's awesome. Exactly, exactly. Personally, I'm in a position right now where I want to shoot for the rest of my life as much as I can for the rest of my life, and uh, it, there, I get no better satisfaction than having a director tell me this is what I had in my head, which I think is incredible that you can take something out of someone's head and make it a reality with the skill sets that you have. I love that. But there are some stories that only I want to tell and that only I know that I can tell. Um, and those are the ones that I'm I'm wanting to DP and direct myself. Of course, with also the, the understanding of how a set is run and making sure that I have a strong gaffer and a strong AD if I do want to take on both jobs. But that is something that I'm interested in transitioning in and that I've slowly started to transition in, in the last year of uh, director DP. Um, again, those are my personal projects that I love and I will continue to do. But um, that's the way that I've found my middle ground. I love shooting for other people, but if I don't shoot and direct something that I created at least once a year, I still feel creatively stagnant. Very cool. Uh, so uh, anyone else uh, answers about uh, branding yourself and you know getting like how, how you seek jobs, how you present yourself outwardly um, when you're talking about finding work or uh, anyone who is thinking about potentially transitioning into directing? I know a handful of you were like, I don't love working with actors. I found out that I like the camera, but uh, if you have more details, please, anyone weigh in. Uh, I agree. Like, I feel like there's nothing wrong with like branding yourself as a DP if that's solely all you want to do. But I think it will also harm you if you, you're not like actively going out of your way to crew up for your peers and your colleagues, because ultimately that's how you learn and kind of revamp and shape yourself as an image maker. And so um, I personally primarily DP, but I occasionally will like operate for one of my friends or gaff for one of my friends because um, there's always just room to learn and grow. And I get excited just like I'm corny. I love collaborating with my friends. And so just finding different ways to like still do what I love, but also support my friends how the same way that they support me as well. Yeah. yeah. About that lateral networking. Remember. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, if it's really good if like, I personally feel like you should probably try to stay, um, try to brand yourself at least in one area. So even if you're, if you mainly want to DP, like if you're doing, camera operation or AC, like that's, a, that's in a similar area. And I don't think that's really going to harm you. Um, but if you start offering yourself as like a DP and then also a producer and also something else, that's when it can, mm -hmm. I think, kind of not benefit you as much because people might, there's, those are very different things. And there's probably one thing you like more. So if you like DPing more, then it's probably better to stay in the camera department or even do gaffing because that has lighting and you're learning more that's going to help you with the camera. But um, so just, I think limiting it is like to one kind of area is really helpful, at least when branding yourself. Like I work with cameras um, and yeah, with directing <laughs> for me, I am not very good with working with actors. I don't really enjoy it. And so I personally see myself as being a cinematographer for the rest of my days, but um, I do agree with Sylvia also that there are certain projects that are very personal and I do, I would want to do those on my own, but for me, those would probably end up being more of a documentary or something where it's really more about like visual and, and it is telling a story, but I don't have to direct um, people. So it's yeah. like a directing adjacent. Yeah. <laughs> Christine. Um, and I, and I'm someone who definitely has branded themselves as a camera person because like I am like, you know, ACing and opping and I go up and down all the time. And that's, that's fine with me right now because like, I gotta eat, I gotta, I gotta pay bills. Um, but like, I fully, the way I deal with it is that I'm just super transparent. Like Sylvia said, like I tell everybody that I want to shoot, like I want to do this. I want to, I want to shoot this kind of film and I'm very, 
I, you just have to be open and honest about your goals. And I think a lot of people are really receptive to that, um, you know, like, and taking all the opportunities that you do get, like every now and then I'll be on a show and they'll, the DP will want me to do like B-roll on like a second unit thing. And then that's like, you know, that's a, that's what DPs do. And so like just taking all those opportunities that you can get. Um, and also when you're on set, like I'm a set person, so I love being on set and just love the energy of it, love having a walkie in my ear. Um, so I think when you're on set absorbing everything as well, like noticing what other people are doing um, and kind of, get, I don't wanna say stealing, but <laughs> borrowing ideas um, is always like that's, you learn by seeing, other, I'm a very visual learner. So I learn by seeing someone set up a light in, in this certain setup. Totally. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. No, that's great. And we have like a million more questions, but we're at the end of our panel, sadly. It seems like clearly this is a conversation that will be ongoing. So definitely follow all of these wonderful women on Instagram and, and maybe uh, you know comments or your questions there. But so as a final question, thank you so much all for being here. Can you tell us first, uh, what is the most beautiful shot example of cinematography you've seen recently? And uh, what are you working on next? How can we keep in touch? So uh, we'll start with, let's start with Kaylee, uh, if you have an answer to start off with. Uh, sure. Um, trying to think of the most beautiful cinematography I've seen. Um, the Crown just came out this week and uh, that show is just beautiful. They have the best budget. They they do so that much helps. with lighting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous show. Um, so I can't think of necessarily a, a specific shot, but I mean, pretty much everything in there, I'm just like, this is so fun to watch so um highly recommend that um and then sorry what was the other uh, what question? what are you doing next how can we follow along with your amazing career oh um what i'm working on next i don't have any current projects coming up next but i do always i'm always posting them on my instagram and website um it's at kaylee christina or kayleechristina.com so yeah you can follow me there perfect all right uh sylvia Beautiful cinematography um, example. Where can we follow you along your journey? It's beautiful, but not because it's pretty. Okay. Um, so I've been, um, I'm currently um, working on prepping for a feature with a, a friend that I had from um, grad school. And she's a horror director through and through. Um, I've been studying It Follows and Hereditary a lot. There is a shot in Hereditary where there is an ominous figure in the room and you can barely see it to the point where like, I was so amazed because it was a scene where it, 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 it it's, it's a wide and you see, I, I believe it was the sun in bed. And then there's an ominous figure in the corner and it takes you, it's like at the top corner of the room too. So it's terrifying, but it takes your, it takes a while for your eyes to adjust the same way as if it were in real life. And you see like a shadow happening in the room. And to me, that just struck me as, wow, look at the risks that that DP took because he doesn't actually know the output of every single screen. So like the, the risk he took in a, like a stop and a half different, a stop difference maybe between the background and the actual ominous figure that made it look like, it made it look like the way that you would be seeing it in real life. To me, it blew me away. I was like, that's risky and it worked. And that was something I was impressed by. Very cool. And and uh, where's the best way to follow along with all the cool stuff that you're working on? Is it Instagram, website, somewhere else? Instagram, right now, I've really checked out of posting, to be honest. I'm actually trying to see how that's going to, like, personally, it's a per per personal experiment. I want to see how it's affecting my work. Um, I'll start posting in, within the next month. But yeah, I'll start posting that. And I, I have a pilot coming up that um, it's in two weeks and it's a pilot of, with an ensemble cast. And it's a comedy. And I'm excited to do that because we need comedy right now. Truer words have never been stated. Uh, Shade, what about you? Beautiful cinematography example and where we can follow along on your path. Um, ooh, I've been binging the show on Netflix, uh, Grand Army. Have you guys been watching it? Oh, oh my God, intense, intense high school war flashbacks. But um, basically this, this one scene, um, I won't spoil it, but there's this really 
raw but also uncomfortable scene where a woman experiences sexual assault and usually like there's a certain way of how that's kind of captured but uh with this scene specifically they kind of like played with like highly saturated colors with lighting specifically and it felt kind of surreal but also like mm -hmm. felt really true a true and raw to the actual moment and um, that's something that I personally really resonate is like playing with like surrealism and like magical realism elements in cinematography. And then they played with prisms as well in that scene specifically. And I thought that was really interesting. And so that scene has been really sitting with me, but watch that show at your own risk for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and where's the best place to follow you? Uh, Sade India on all platforms. Um, I'm mainly on Twitter, I talk a lot of nonsense, but um, sometimes on Instagram, I drop the occasional still and stuff. Um, and I just recently got uh, actually uh, sponsored by Small HD, which is really dope. So I'll be posting a lot of like gear reviews upcoming, which I'm excited for. Um, so look out for that as well. Love Thank that. <laughs> and Christine. Um. So I'm going to go with something I feel like a lot of people didn't get to see last year that was not nominated for uh, best documentary was Honeyland. And uh, it's one of like the most beautiful nonfiction movies I've ever seen. Uh, and I looked it up afterwards because I was so curious and they just did, it was all like DSLRs because they were in a really confined space and it's all like oil lamp, oil lamps and natural lighting. So I thought that's like something, the idea of like framing and, making thing, giving yourself that kind of challenge of uh, not having a ton of lighting. So that's one of those really good documentaries. I can't, can't recommend more. Um, awesome. And, and yeah, following follow, you. follow me on IG. Uh, it's pretty much where I do everything nowadays. Um, and it's just Christine Marie Kelly. And I also have a website it's on there and in, in the bio. So and we're, we're dropping, of course, all of the links in the world in the comment section on YouTube. So folks who want to just like click and watch these wonderful women work, uh, all of those are available there. And they will also be available in the YouTube description once we update that. All right. Well, thank you so much, all four of you for being here, especially those of you who have been on set today and every once in a while we'll look over as something is happening. We are so, so grateful for your time and expertise and empathy and thoughtfulness. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for doing this. We are so excited to see what you shoot next. So thank you again. And uh, hopefully we will see you around the interwebs. So um, thank you so much. And for everyone else uh, watching, thanks so much for watching. Thank you for being here. This is I'm talking now. Okay. <laughs> nope. Uh-oh, it looks like my connection froze. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> I don't know how much you heard of that, but basically everyone go to seedandspark.com slash events. That's where you can find out all that we're up to next. Also, if you are able and you loved this session, we would love your support to continue bringing these awesome events to you for free. So check out the link in the video description and in the comments as always to contribute what you can uh, if you found today's workshop uh, helpful. It's a pay what you can structure just to give us a little bit of oomph to go into the end of our year. Thank you so much for being here. We are honored to be a part of this community and we hope to see you all soon. Have a nice one everyone.